We are going to look at Ecclesiastes together over the next couple of weeks. Um, how we're going to do that is by looking at the start of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, together, and then next week we'll look at the end of Ecclesiastes, and as we do that we'll look at the middle of Ecclesiastes as we go. But I'm going to need God's help because I'm trying to do a big book in two talks, um, and he's going to need to help us understand this word. So uh, would you pray with me as we begin this evening? Heavenly Father, thank you for this afternoon. Lord, thank you for this place where we can gather as your people to hear from your word and to encourage one another. Lord, would you speak clearly through me now um, and would you open all of our hearts to hear your word speak to us, uh, your people, as we come before you now. Uh, God, we thank you that you are here with us, that you help us understand your word and that your word is the same now as it always has been. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word and how it speaks to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I am going to explain the video. Um, it's not just one of my most favourite openings to a movie ever, um, and it wasn't just a decoy to let me slowly hobble up the front this afternoon. No, has any, have any of you ever listened closely to the words in that opening scene to The Lion King? Maybe as it played, then you picked up on a few words and you thought, oh, I get it. If you didn't, let me read to you the words of the song the circle of life. Nah, t- no, I'm not going to do that bit. <laughs> Did you know, though, in that, it's in Zulu, right? In that part of the, the intro to the Lion King, the words are, here comes a lion, a father. Yes, a lion who conquers, a lion. It's a very biblical song, this circle of life. But after the Zulu bit, we get to the English part of the song, and we hear these words. From the day we arrive on the planet and blinking step into the sun, there's more to see than can ever be seen, more to do than can ever be done. There's far too much to take in here, more to find than can ever be found. But the sun rolling high through the sapphire sky keeps great and small on the endless round. It's the circle of life. And it moves us all through despair and hope, through faith and love, till we find our place on the path unwinding in the circle, the circle of life. Now, as I read that, did it remind you of Ecclesiastes chapter 1? See, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we have the circle of life, don't we? It's full of language of, of nature and the world and the way it goes round and round. As, as we read through Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we can almost picture the beginning of the Lion King, the sun rising, the streams flowing, the animals skipping. Let me read a few verses for you from Ecclesiastes chapter 1. You've got it there on your handouts. If you look down at verse 4, generations come and generations go, but the earth is there forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. The wind blows to the south and it turns to the north. Round and round it goes. All the streams flow into the sea. Yet the sea is never full. The eye it doesn't have enough of seeing nor the ear full of hearing. Well, see, what, what has been here will be again and what has been done will be done again. There's nothing of which you can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. Even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. So that's the circle of life, isn't it, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I actually looked up, when I found this connection, I thought surely um, the Lion King was inspired by Ecclesiastes, but sadly it wasn't. But this is the circle of life that Ecclesiastes depicts in chapter 1. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the book of Ecclesiastes, if this all sounds a bit weird to you, let me try to help by giving you some background to this book. This book, Ecclesiastes, is kind of a a compilation of all of the words of this teacher. Some translations have the preacher. Literally, this is the one who speaks to the assembly. This is this wise man who has these wise words for all people to hear. This is actually where we get the title of Ecclesiastes from. In Greek, that name, the Kohelet in Hebrew, is Ecclesiastes in Greek. This is a book about the wisdom of this teacher. 
Now, it sounds like this teacher could be Solomon, because it says he's the son of David and king over Jerusalem, but then there's parts of the book that don't quite sound like Solomon. We don't actually quite know who this is. But what we have are his words. The words of the teacher. The words of this wise man. And this book is all about this guy trying to pull apart life. He looks at all the crevices of life, the life that he's lived, and he tries to pull it apart and find what is the meaning. It's that age-old question, isn't it? What is the meaning of life? That's what the Kohelet, the teacher, is trying to find. But, as you would have noticed, for a book that's all about finding meaning, it doesn't really start the way you would expect it to. If you look at verse 2, we kind of get the catchphrase of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. If you look there at verse 2, the teacher begins this speech about wisdom and knowledge and meaning by saying these words. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, if you went to see a motivational life speaker, And he got up the front and said, meaningless, everything is meaningless. You want your money back, right? That's not what you would expect of a book that's about meaning. But I see, I think part of our issue here is that it's not as dire as it sounds in English. See, Ecclesiastes wasn't written in English, it was written in Hebrew, uh, like we talked about with Kohelet and the meaning of that word. Here the word is quite hard to capture with just one English word. If you've come across Ecclesiastes before, I'm sure you know where I'm going with This. Other translations have vanity or futility. There's this idea behind this word, and I'm going to give you a visual demonstration. What is the teacher saying? Well, life is mist, life is vapor. The Hebrew word here, havel, is literally mist or smoke or vapor. So, in the context of Ecclesiastes, what the teacher here is saying is that everything, this this circle of life that we live in, you see it's there one minute, but then it seems to disappear. It's it's temporary, it's it's short-lived in some sense. You can try to kind of grab hold of it and control it, but, but you can't. You can't control this life, he says. It is a real thing, you can see it, I can taste a little bit. You can maybe smell it by now. But it's mysterious. We don't understand this strange circle of life, the teacher says. But we're all in this circle of life. So how are we going to live in it? As the teacher cries out, meaningless or futile or vanity, he's conveying that there's Something about this life that just goes round and round and it's temporary and we can't control it and he's just trying to work out what is going on. Now if you're still struggling with understanding what's going on here, I've, given, I've taken time this week to write a modern version of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Hopefully this connects with your heart a little bit more as I read this. What do people gain from all their work under the sun? People come and people go, but the dishes... They're always there. As the sun rises, the washing, it goes out. And as it sets, we bring it back in, but only to be dirtied again. You brush your hair to look good, but then the wind blows and messes it up, and you just have to brush it again. There's truly nothing new under the sun. What was fashionable 30 years ago is all of a sudden fashionable again. All of this is just wearisome, more than I can bear. Life just goes round and round, and it feels like sometimes I just struggle to keep up. See, whether we like it or not, Ecclesiastes conveys something that we know. We're in this circle of life. Sometimes life just feels repetitive. Sometimes we just feel like we're doing the same thing over and over again. And the message of Ecclesiastes depending on your view, is either it's depressing, it's unmotivating, and it's just stupid, or it's a little bit refreshing and kind of relieving in a way, and true. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this is where the title of the sermon on your handouts comes in. 
It's a matter of gain versus gift. It's a matter to, it's a, a, a matter of the attitude of gain or the attitude of gift. Let me explain. So if you have an attitude of gain towards life, if you view your life as an opportunity to gain things for yourself, what Ecclesiastes says is you are going to be bitterly disappointed. Look at what the teacher says in verse 3 of Ecclesiastes 1. What do people gain from all their labours of which they toil under the sun? What do people gain? Is there anything really to gain? And as we read on in Ecclesiastes, he keeps making the same point. In chapter 2, we learn that this teacher, he pursued gain to the end of itself, of himself. He built a massive house. He had all these slaves that worked for him. He owned great flocks and herds. He amassed silver and gold. He had all the women he could want. In verse 10 of chapter 2, if you have a Bible there, you can look there with me. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labours, and this was the reward for my toil. But then in verse 11 he says, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. So the teacher says this mentality of trying to gain things in life, it's going to get you nowhere. He says it's like you're trying to chase after the wind. I had this friend at college who taught us a game. I encourage you to play this game if you would like to, if you like yearly kind of games that come out every year. This is a great one. Every autumn, when the leaves start to fall, you just have to catch one leaf. Now that might sound easy until you give it a go. So one uh, trip up to Armadale, I was there with some friends. Uh, one of the friends is here tonight. And we decided, hey, let's play this game. Armadale's a beautiful place. It was autumn. All the leaves were falling. We thought, let's give it a crack. Let's catch a leaf, everyone. There was about 10 of us probably in a group. And man, it was ridiculous. As you're going to catch the leaves, you think you've got them and the wind blows them and you kind of stumble and you're diving and you're slipping over. I think Katie actually slipped over and grazed herself at one point in that game. She's nodding up the back. It was a ridiculous game to play, but it was fun. But I thought to myself, imagine if you... We're just walking down the street and you looked over to the park and saw 10, 20, 30-year-old people just running around and you had no idea what they were doing. It would look ridiculous. Now imagine the same scene but in the middle of springtime. There's no leaves falling. It's just a bunch of 20-something-year-olds, weird kids from Bible college, just running around trying to catch the wind. It's a ridiculous picture. And that's what the teacher in Ecclesiastes says. It's ridiculous to pursue gain. Because if you chase gain, it's like you're just chasing after mist. You can't grab it. It's just going to leave you empty-handed, the teacher says. But see, sadly, as people, and I include myself in this, I'm a person... We always fall into the habit of this, don't we? Chasing after gain. We spend our lives with that mentality of, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had a little bit more money, then I could finally get the things that would make me feel content. If I just had a little bit more success in my my job, then I'd feel finally satisfied with my work. If I just had a slightly bigger house, then, you know, me and my family, we could be finally comfortable. Maybe it's travel. Maybe it's if I see another place. Maybe it's more security. Maybe it's more pleasures. We always want just a little bit more. We can turn things that are good in and of themselves into idols that we just chase, like chasing the wind. We never catch them. And eventually we lose our contentment and we need more. As soon as we finally think we've got the thing that we once longed for, we just instantly realise, no, we don't have quite enough and we want just a little bit more. In 
the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, our eyes never have enough of seeing nor our ears of hearing, do they? We just always want a little bit more. Never truly satisfied, Ecclesiastes says. So if this is the problem that the teacher teaches us about life in Ecclesiastes, well then, does he give us a solution? For the most part of Ecclesiastes, it feels like a pretty dire situation for humankind, but there are little glimpses of hope in Ecclesiastes. One of them comes in chapter 5. If you've got a Bible again, you can turn there with me. In chapter 5, at the end of the chapter, he's just gone through and talked about how riches, they're meaningless too. Chasing after money, meaningless. Chasing after the wind. And at the end of chapter 5, in verse 18, he says this. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labour under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. See, what's the solution? Well, it's, it's gift. It's viewing life as a gift. Here is my one-sentence summary of Ecclesiastes. If you're taking notes, or if you're remembering today, this is the one thing I want you to remember. What does Ecclesiastes teach us? It teaches us to stop living our lives for gain and to instead enjoy our lives as a gift. Stop living your life for gain, the teacher says. Instead, just enjoy your life as a gift. Did you notice all of the gift sort of language that were in those verses? Look back at them with me. We see that The life that we have at the end of verse 18, the few days of life, what is it? Well, God has given them to us. And then moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, see that, that it's not just the wealth and possessions he gives us, he gives us the actual ability to enjoy those things. We are to accept them because this is a what? Gift of God. It's not that having nice things is bad in and of itself. No, Ecclesiastes says, enjoy food, enjoy drink, enjoy your friends, even enjoy your work. But it's got to do with our attitude. See, we need to see those things as a gift. See, everything that we have, even everything that we achieve, even our ability to enjoy those things is ultimately a gift from God. So we need to start fostering a heart that is thankful towards God if we want to find contentment. If you want to be satisfied, if you want to be content in what you do, it's not going to be found by gaining a little bit more. No, it's going to be by stopping and realising that your life is a gift. Everything that you have is a gift from God. What's an example of this? Well, here, let me give you a completely hypothetical scenario. Say you're a 27-year-old pastor from Lake Cadillac and you've just had your first child. But you're also trying to build a pizza oven in the backyard and your parents arrive in about a week's time and you really, really really want to finish it. And just as you get into the backyard and you finally get all your tools out of storage and you're ready to start getting cracking on this pizza oven, your wife comes out and she's looking a little bit tired. She's got your baby in her arms and she just says, can you just take her for a little bit? I'm just tired and need some rest. In that moment, this hypothetical person could do one of two things. 
They could take that child and be bitter. Be bitter about the fact that they were going to finish this pizza oven and now if I don't get to it, my parents will arrive and it won't be ready and then I've got to cure it for like a week and then are we even going to have pizzas without my parents and what is even the point of trying to do this pizza oven? And I used to be able to do all sorts of things before I had kids and now it's just an interruption to my day. Or you could just stop. You could put aside the fact that the pizza oven may not get finished in time. And you can just enjoy the incredible gift of a moment with your little girl. Enjoy the incredible gift God has given you in your arms that you've wanted and prayed for for so long. See how often we let our pursuit of gain and doing things get in the way of our acceptance and enjoyment of the gifts God has given us. Now, if we learn to view our lives through this gift lens, it doesn't mean that we're not going to do anything. It doesn't mean that we're not going to gain things or be productive in any way. No, but what it will do is help us to start noticing things that we've been given. And all of a sudden, the fact that life is kind of a bit temporary and a bit out of control and a bit mysterious actually isn't a burden. No, it's actually a delight. See, all of a sudden, things that interrupt our busy schedules can actually be moments to enjoy God's good gifts, to slow us down and to help us look around. I mean, it only took a global pandemic for a few of us to do that, didn't it? We need to sometimes just stop that pursuit of gain and just be happy with with what God has given us. Because we know that everything we have has been given to us by God. And not just that, that the God that has given those things to us is loving and caring and generous and is going to provide for all of our needs. See, this is where we can find contentment, the teacher says, by enjoying the good gifts of God. And if we can do this, then it also allows us to be generous towards others, doesn't it? So if you have an attitude that's gain-oriented, then you foster greed and selfishness because you need to hold on to all those things that you've achieved for yourself. But if you see life as a gift, then you can give to others because you've given, given everything that you have. You can give to others your time when people interrupt your busy schedule. You can give them your attention, even if you're really busy and maybe they're being a bit of a hassle. You can even give to people in money or food or hospitality. You can be generous because you look around and you realise all the amazing things that you've been given by God. This lens of seeing life as a gift truly changes the way you look at everything. Because life is about a gift, not gain. That's what the teacher in Ecclesiastes is trying to help us to see. And now I just want to finish on this final point. As we look at this idea of, of gift and of gain, there is no place where this is more clearly seen than when it comes to our salvation. See, if what the teacher in Ecclesiastes is saying is true about our lives and our experience and the circle of life that we're a part of, then it should come as no surprise to us that when God made a plan to save us from death and to give us new life, it came in the form of a gift, didn't it? See, Jesus' life was given to us from God. Jesus is the greatest gift that we have ever received. That's why we hand out gifts on Christmas Day when he was born. And the forgiveness that Jesus offers you can't be gained by impressive achievement or good behaviour. No, it can only be accepted as a gift. Because life is about gifts, not gain. So if you believe that Jesus is a gift and you've accepted that gift, then don't take that gift for granted. Don't accept the gift of God's grace and then try to earn it yourself. Be thankful. 
Stop. Take a moment and be thankful. Be thankful for the life that you've been given and be thankful for Jesus' life that was given for you. And be generous. Share that gift with others. Share your life with others. Share Jesus' life with others. And if you haven't accepted that gift, if you've never thought of your life as a gift from God, if you've never accepted the free gift of God's forgiveness, then today you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to find a level of satisfaction and contentment that you will never find anywhere else. See, we long for contentment. We long for Satisfaction, And the problem is often we look for it in the wrong places. It's sitting there right in front of us. It's, it's God who gives it to us. See, we are all stuck in this circle of life. This life that just sometimes feels like it's going round and round and going nowhere. But in Jesus, we know where this life is going. We have the hope of life, not just now, but eternally in him. So as we live in this life now that feels a bit chaotic at times, a bit repetitive, what attitude are you going to live with? Are you going to keep pursuing after gain? Because Ecclesiastes says you're only going to be disappointed. Or are you going to see your life as a gift? A gift from God and you're going to give thanks to the one who gave it to you. How about we pray and we thank our wonderful God for the wonderful gift of life he's given us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this life. Lord, thank you for the sun that rises every day. Thank you for the extra hour of light we have now in daylight savings to enjoy in the afternoon. God, thank you for the beautiful trees that are wonderful to look at, but not only that, give us air to breathe, oxygen to survive on. God, you have surrounded us with your good gifts. Would you help us today to to see your gifts afresh, to put aside our own pursuit of gain and to live and enjoy the goodness of who you are and what you've given us. And God, ultimately, would you help us to be thankful, thankful to you for our lives, but ultimately, Lord, thankful for the life of Jesus. Thank you that you gave him for us so that we can be brought back into relationship with you. Help us to live out that relationship today, Lord, not as if we've gained it through anything we've done, but as the wonderful gift that it is to be in your presence and to be your child. We just pray this all in Jesus' awesome and wonderful name. Amen.